Hi everyone, welcome to another one of my GPU buying guides, this time for the RTX 4080. The point is to inform people on which model have better hardware and biases. Sure, any RTX 4080 would perform pretty similarly at default, except for the more extreme cards when overclocked. But you can always pick the best card for the price you're aiming to spend, even when you just want the cheapest RTX 4080. You can still pick the best one in that certain price bracket. In the previous generation, Power limits were very important, as that makes the biggest impact on GPU performance. For the RTX 40 series GPUs, however, this is no longer the case. The RTX 40 series cards are now made in TSMC's super efficient 5 nanometer process that's much more efficient than the previous Samsung 8 nanometer process. All the while, Nvidia is still increasing the power limits. This means that these new GPUs are much less restricted by the power consumption which means they really just boost higher without constantly hitting the power limiter. This also means that the manufacturers can't easily boost performance by just putting a higher power limit, like in the previous generation, as there's really no point in increasing power limits if they aren't causing any throttling in the first place. Similar things can be said about the cooling solutions on these new GPUs, as it seems like the side effect of Nvidia specifying a high power limit by default meant that all the manufacturers designed massive coolers, really expecting the GPUs to redline the power limit like in the previous generation. While the reality is, the RTX 40 series GPUs rarely max out their power limits. Yes, even the RTX 4090 doesn't really consume the whole 450 watt TDP. This means that there is practically no graphics card model out there that has a bad cooler in this generation. Because these new GPUs are much more efficient, they also don't need as powerful a VRM as the previous GPUs. But a powerful VRM is still important to enthusiasts that intend to overclock or undervolt. Not only because a stronger VRM can supply more power to an overclocked GPU, but also because the weaker VRMs are almost always a result of cost cutting, which means that there are less capacitors being used that results in noisier voltage output that will result in less clock speed at the same voltage or other cost-cutting measures that just results in worse power and voltage regulation for the graphics card. The bottom line is, there's no excuse for putting weak VRMs on high-end graphics cards that cost more than ever before. Which is why there is good news for all the RTX 4080s, where lots of them are literally just a copy-paste of the RTX 4090 design and maybe minus a few VRM phases. But basically all the VRMs are extreme overkill. For the RTX 4080, the minimum NVIDIA reference specification is the same 14 phase by 50 amp VRM, just like in the RTX 4090, totaling 700 amps for the core and 3 phase by 50 amp, totaling 150 amps for the memory. These 770 amp cards are also exactly the same, except that they use power stages rated at a higher 55 amp. They're basically the same as the 700 amp VRMs though. But this reference base spec VRM only applies to the reference board that is designed by Nvidia that partners could use, like the Inno 3D cards I showed. But there are partner cards like from Pellet, who use their own PCB, and this is news to me as well because a viewer pointed it out in the comment section of a Russian reviewer reviewing this card, but this card has a 12 phase VRM, which is under the reference base spec VRM. And yeah, this is worse than the reference VRM, but Really 600 amp is still more than enough for an RTX 4080, but I thought that it's quite an important piece of information for your consideration that the Pallet Gaming Pro and as well as the GameWord Phoenix, which is the same card, actually has a worse 12 phase VRM that only does 600 amps. But either ways, even these bottom tier VRMs for the RTX 4080 is still way overkill for the RTX 4080 core because it doesn't really use that much power, especially running at their out of the box speeds where the GPU only runs at 1.05 volts by default, and if we assume it constantly maxes out its 320 watt power limit, which isn't the case at all, it is still only drawing 305 amps of current at most. The base model reference VRMs could literally power two separate RTX 4080s. I don't know why this is the case, but I'm really loving this generation of Nvidia GPUs, where it is basically impossible to buy a card with a bad VRM. This is definitely an improvement from the previous generation. 
You could do extreme overclocking and shunt mod any RTX 4080 to give it unlimited power and exactly none of them would blow up. If you volt modded and raised the power consumption using liquid nitrogen in extreme overclocking for example, you'd need to make the core draw way over twice the power before the VRMs would actually have a chance of blowing up. At that point, the core would probably blow up first from getting too hot due to the high heat density. So safe to say that all the VRMs are much much more than enough for all the RTX 4080s. Now all I'm saying is that this time around, even with the reference spec VRMs, they're all overkill and so the VRMs should be the least of anyone's concern when buying an RTX 4080. It should only be a concern in a situation when you're comparing two different cards with similar cooling and power limit performance. In that case, there's no reason not to buy the card with the better VRMs. And it does seem like at least Asus and Galax agree with me here. Asus typically designs their tough gaming cards with VRMs that rival the top cards. But for the 4080, they use a near reference level VRM on the tough, which proves just how overkill the reference spec VRM is. Galax also has no problems putting a mere 800 amp VRM, which is still a lot, on their cards while giving them a 420 watt max power limit just like the other top end cards. So it really doesn't require a super strong VRM to max out to 420 watts on the power limit. The only real standout here is the Asus Strix, which does have a digital MPS 2888A voltage controller that has an I2C interface that you can solder an external controller like the Elmore EVC2SX. And this allows you to control the voltages manually, which is especially useful for extreme overclocking. But otherwise, for most people, this is not really a huge advantage. Similarly, for the power limits, the default 320 watt power limit is already plenty for the RTX 4080 to sustain their maximum boost clocks at default settings just like the RTX 4090. Which means the maximum power limits are the only important values here, as that allows enthusiasts who want to overclock chase that final few points in benchmarks. I think it's pretty black and white what cards overclockers should choose if it's just based on the power limits. Literally just get the cards with a 400 watt or higher power limit and you should have more than enough power to max out an RTX 4080. For the rest of the cards with a less than 400 watt maximum power limit, I just have one question. Why? Why do these manufacturers even need to limit them to less than 400 watts? especially the ones that don't allow any power limit increase at all, like the Inno 3D cards for example. The 12VH power connector can already supply up to 600 watts, and the VRMs are literally super overkill to the point that you cannot explode them even if you try, unless you do some insane stuff with the voltages or something. So why not just let people have fun and give them a higher power limit as an option? I just don't get it. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, it is impossible to find performance results on every model as not every one of them gets reviewed. But I did gather the performance results measured by Tech Power Up and Kid Guru to combine them to a really large result that can be used to compare the cards. I combined the results by correcting the temperatures to Tech Power Up's results by calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured on the same cards that Tech Power Up tested and applying a correction to any card that isn't tested by Tech Power Up to be able to be added in the same graph. The result is this combined graph, which isn't completely accurate by any means, but it is good enough to give an idea of how these cards stack up. As you can see, the manufacturers again made extremely overkill coolers for the RTX 4080. Even the worst card that has been reviewed here, the Colorful Ultra, does not even go over 70 degrees. Sure, it's apparently a little louder than the rest at 40 dB, but it has so much temperature overhead you could probably just lower the fan speed and it'll be pretty good. The MSI Supreme X, Gigabyte Gaming OC, and Asus Strix OC all essentially copy-paste the coolers from the RTX 4090, including their vapor chamber and everything. This is why they're the best performing models on the RTX 4080. However, the Gigabyte Gaming OC makes a bit more noise at similar temperatures than the other two cards. Then there's the disappointing Zotac Amp Extreme Aero again which looks pretty good just looking at the temperatures, but it's actually quite a bit louder than the gaming OC, while still slightly hotter. This is because they took the already mediocre RTX 4090 cooler and removed the vapor chamber. Actually, this is the biggest differentiator for all the RTX 4080 cards. 
whether the cooler has a vapor chamber or not, where the cards without vapor chambers will perform similar or worse than the NVIDIA FE card, which does have a vapor chamber but has the disadvantage of needing to look neat and tidy with just two fans. There's actually a card that impressed me that does not have a vapor chamber, and those are the PNY cards, where apparently they run perfectly cool and quiet even without a vapor chamber and just using a copper base plate, which is pretty impressive to me. The Gainward Phantom GS, MSI Gaming X Trio, and Inno 3D iChill X3 all has the same vapor chamber delete downgrade, like the Zotec card, which makes them relatively worse than the other models that has a vapor chamber. For the other cards that don't have reviews yet, here's the tier list that I came up with. As per usual, this isn't 100% accurate as it's really just my estimation from seeing the cards that were reviewed and comparing them to how the coolers of these other non-reviewed cards are built. This should still be accurate enough that the cards in the same tier will perform similarly in terms of cooler performance. There is no particular order inside the tiers themselves aside from alphabetical order. In the SS tier are the typical water-cooled cards, which will always have an advantage over the air-cooled cards. Although I really don't see a point in water-cooling these cards, just the same as the 4090, as the S tier air-cooled cards are so good already. The Asus Trix, Colorful Vulcan, Gigabyte Eros Master, and the MSI Supreme X definitely deserve some praise over here for using the exact same RTX 4090 cooler design, especially keeping the vapor chambers. They are the very definition of going overkill on cooling on a graphics card. Although that crown might actually be taken soon by the announced but as of now unreleased ASUS RTX 4080 Noctua edition, which if it follows tradition will be an ASUS tough card with an enlarged heatsink and two of some of the best 120mm fans, the Noctua NFA 12x25, which will undoubtedly decimate all the other cards in terms of cooling performance and noise levels because this is literally going to be a 4 to 5 slot thick card which is a bit ridiculous but that's what you get for putting case fans on a graphics card. Now the next down will be the A tier cards where these are again cards that kept their vapor chambers from the RTX 4090 siblings. In fact Gigabyte here seems to have gone insane as they even put the same cooler on the Eagle card as their higher end gaming OC card. This is complete with the vapor chamber intact as well, which actually might make this the best value card in terms of cooling performance to price. Oh, and they also have the Aero OC, which is essentially a gaming OC with a white color scheme, so it's just as good. The colorful Advanced OC and Galax cards should also naturally perform well because of their vapor chamber. The real surprise here are the PNY cards, where even though they did not use a vapor chamber, they seem to have a massive enough cooler and enough heat pipes to compete with the other cards here, or they just have a really well-designed copper base plate, I guess. You might notice the ASUS Tough has been absent, which is a bit odd considering they usually are quite near the top in terms of cooling performance. But this is because it's in the B tier this time, along with the other cards that don't have a vapor chamber and perform similarly to the NVIDIA FE card. The ASUS Tough only has one reputable review by tech testers, and it really just performs similarly to the FE card, in terms of both cooling performance and also noise levels. These B tier cards are still extremely good, if you consider how the NVIDIA FE is a copy paste of the RTX 4090 card and runs more than 10 degrees cooler than the 4090 version already, then these B tier cards also have ridiculously good cooling as well. The only cards that are worse than the FE are the C-tier cards, but even then, they run as cool and quiet as mid-tier RTX 4090 cards, so they're really not that bad. Lastly, here is the overall tier list of all the cards. This is not in any particular order within the tiers again, except for alphabetical order, as there are more closely matched cards in this generation than ever before, which makes it really difficult to put one card over the other for the whole stack of different models. If any manufacturer disagrees with this list, please contact me and convince me why your card should be hired by probably sending me a review sample so I can actually see it for myself. Otherwise, I am very confident in the tiers that I place these cards at. The point of this tier list is to buy as high tier cards as possible in the budget that you are spending. 
Buy a higher tier card if it's the same price as a lower tier card that you are looking at. At the top are the Asus Trix, Colorful Neptune, Colorful Vulcan, Gigabyte Eorus cards, and the MSI Supreme cards. Again, the tier lists are not in any particular order, they're just in alphabetical per tier. But yeah, these are the flagships of each of these companies and they do deserve to be at the top of this list. They have the most utterly overkill VRMs, which add on top the already ridiculously overkill reference spec VRM, with the highest power limits as well, and also the most powerful coolers that you can get on an RTX 4080. Although this time the only card really suitable for extreme overclocking is the Asus Trix, which still has a digital voltage controller with an I2C interface that you can solder to an external controller. The next tier down is the S tier, which does everything right and should be as good as it gets for anyone just looking to use the RGX 4080 or even overclock. The VRMs on all the 4080s are so overkill, and these cards all still have vapor chamber coolers with essentially the same power limits as the SS tier cards. So these are basically just as good, maybe just lacking a few of the extra features and better build quality of the SS tier. In fact, even the A tier cards are still really impressive. The Gigabyte Eagle OC for example, has the same vapor chamber cooler and power limits as the Gigabyte cards in the S tier, except that it has a slightly worse VRM so it should only be an A tier card. But again, VRMs don't really matter, and this card should be the strongest contender for the best value if you can find it cheaper than the rest of the cards here. The Palette Game Rock cards and the Palette Based Gain Word cards are also in a much better tier for the 4080 than they were for the 4090. This is because in addition to their good performing cooler, their power limits and VRMs are more in the high tier for a 4080 rather than a low tier in their 4090 versions. The NVIDIA FE does have a lower power limit than the other cards in the A tier, but its build quality and cooling performance should more than make up for it. Now the NVIDIA FE does have a lower power limit than the other cards in the A tier, but its build quality and cooling performance should more than make up for it. Lastly, there's the Zotac card, which has the strongest RTX 4080 VRM and power limit so they could easily be an SS tier card if only their cooler performs as good as how big it is. They just can't seem to get the cooler to perform as good as the other flagship cards from the other manufacturers. Either something wrong with how the fan design is, or the heatsink design, or they might have some lesser performing heat pipes. Then there are the B tier cards, which are still very good cards for those who just want an RTX 4080 and game on it. The Asus Tough unfortunately is in the B tier this time, as it just has a low power limit as well as very standard VRMs and cooling performance. So it's just not as good as how the RTX 4090 Tough was. The Inno 3D cards are again all in the B tier because they still insist on not allowing any power limit increases and putting the reference spec VRMs on all their cards. And even their air-cooled coolers aren't even super impressive this time around, so it's just a pretty okay but nothing impressive lineup from Inno3D. The MSI Gaming X Trio on the other hand seems to handle the RTX 4080's heat much better than it did in the RTX 4090 version, while having better power limits and VRMs than even the Asus Tough, which means this time the Gaming X Trio is better than the Tough, which is quite surprising to me. Then for the PNY cards, they have extremely impressive coolers worthy of almost the S tier. But they still don't allow any power limit increases and have a reference spec VRM again. The Zotac cards on the other hand does allow a bit of power limit increase, which in my opinion makes it better than the Inno 3D cards. Lastly there are the C tier cards, which are only in C tier because they have a cooler that performs very slightly worse than the cards in the B tier. So in essence, there are no bad RTX 4080s that you should avoid. All of them are still very exceptionally good cards, at least from what I've seen. Well, that about wraps it up for this buying guide. May you make the right purchasing decision and enjoy your RTX 4080. Leave a comment down below if you're mad that your RTX 4080 is in low tier and leave a like if I made you feel good about your RTX 4080 purchase. Oh and of course, if my evaluation seems wrong compared to your personal experience with a certain model, please do let me know down below as well. And as always, subscribe if you don't want to miss more buying guides like this, considering how pretty inconsistent I am with these. 
Although I'm kind of going for a streak here for this RTX 4090 and then going straight to the 4080 and hopefully next on the 4070 Ti. Thanks for watching.